All right, cool. It's 420. Hi, friends. So I'm Emily. I'm an undergrad at the University of British Columbia and software developer. And you can reach me at hello at emily.ma. And you can also follow along with the slides for this talk at emily.ma slash OSSNE2024. So I've recently had the privilege of working with professors Clayton D'Souza, Dongwook Yoon, and Ivan Beshesnik at UBC on the topic of understanding open source collaboration work practices empirically in the real world. We've understood some uh, hidden context and some unspoken patterns in open source collaboration that GitHub and other developer platforms don't reveal. And today, I'll be talking about how we highlighted that. We scraped over 50 large open source projects hosted on GitHub and developed a novel graph-based perspective that we're calling the GitHub PR issue graph. Today, I'll be talking about the novel collaboration patterns we observe, as well as the attributes of this PR issue graph and their implications. You'll walk away with a new outlook on managing open source development, able to identify common patterns of collaboration and understand what they might mean for your project and community. I hope this talk will serve to spark some discussion about how you can be more mindful of these workflow types as we lead open source development efforts. So how many of you all know about GitHub already? OK, cool. I can skip this part. So GitHub is typically adopted by open source projects as a central platform for collaboration. On GitHub, community bug reports, feature requests, and general discussion about project takes place in what are called issues. And I'd like to highlight that issues have statuses. So they can be open if the work hasn't been fixed yet, if a problem remains unaddressed. And they can be closed if the work has been fixed or if the discussion has been deemed off topic or closed. On GitHub, the mechanism for integrating new work into a project is called a pull request or a PR. So these also have statuses, so they can be open if the work is undergoing or will undergo review. They might be closed if the work was deemed unsatisfactory or extraneous, and they might be merged if the project has integrated the work. People review code in PRs, but they also can link to previously created issues to create this explicit connection between the two. So something that usually happens is that someone will report some problem, and another contributor will come along to propose a solution in a PR. And that PR will link to this previously created issue. So here, that issue and PR has a link type of fixes. And GitHub supports two explicitly created link types, fixes and duplicates. So if you mention any of the keywords associated with these link types with a issue or PR number, GitHub will automatically create that link for you. So here we use the closes keyword, which is under the fixes link type. If we visualize this as a graph for a second, something basic but interesting starts to emerge. Let's imagine these issues and PRs as nodes in a graph with the links between them as edges. We can start to visualize the type of the node. So it can be a circle for a PR and a square for an issue, as well as their status. So they might be purple for merge, green for open, and red for close, just like on the GitHub UI. So here's a visualization of the examples on this screen. We have this issue, 8150, that's being closed because it's been addressed by this merge PR, 8156. Here's another example from the discord.py project this time with a duplicate link. So you can see that this issue on the left, issue 7186, was marked as a duplicate of the issue on the right, 7140. And you can notice that the issue on the right was both created earlier and uncovers that same problem of this missing link. So prior software engineering research has focused extensively on these individual links. While 85, uh, so the examples I've just shown have these explicit link types, so either fixes or duplicates. But about 85% of the links on GitHub don't actually have one of these link types. They're just sort of blank, according to research done by Chopra et al. So researchers have primarily been trying to classify these blank links into richer categories than just fixes or duplicates. And many distinct papers have come up with their own taxonomies for these links, including things like dependent or relevant or enhanced. And some work has also been done to do this classification of blank links automatically with NLP. But we wanted to zoom out of this previous very focused research on individual links and take a look at multiple issues and PRs and the links between them all. 
Our research is the first to visualize multi-node clusters of issues and PRs as a graph. This graph perspective grants us more context as we simply have more relationships and metadata to examine, which in turn grants us a richer understanding of the work practices that are followed by a project. For example, by examining multiple issues and PRs, we can see if in a project developers tend to break their work up into smaller chunks for review, or if there's a lot of competition in certain areas of a project. This graph perspective is what we've nicknamed the PR issue graph. And for the rest of the talk, I'll be, I'll be showing you some of the hidden insights we found lurking in it. But you might be wondering how we did all of this analysis in the first place. We started by taking uh, the sample of 56 projects, uh, large open source projects that were hosted on GitHub based on a prior sample by work done by Shofer et al. We took all of the components, the contents of each of the issues and PRs, their metadata, and the links between them and we analyzed more than 90,000 issues and PRs. We then took a diversity sample of about 60 clusters of connected issues and PRs. And within that sample, we analyzed each of the uh, contents of the issues and PRs to understand the collaboration that was happening in them. From there, we received some, uh, we observed some of these very frequent reoccurring structural patterns, and we observed that they might represent work practices in open source software development. So to scale up our analysis, we imported each of these issues and PRs into Neo4j, which is this graph database management software. With Neo4j, you can write reusable queries, which we did to find all the occurrences of certain structural patterns. And on the slide here, you can see the built-in query browser visualizing some of these results. From here, we iteratively refined these queries. So we'd take the results that were computed, uh, go through them, make sure that we're computing what we expected, and go through back to tweak those queries. We also built an image visualization and uh, interactive explorer module, which we called Workflows Explorer. You can drag around the projects as well as inspect the individual issues and PRs and see everything in context. So we use this not only to streamline that iterative query refinement process, but also to validate our workflow type definitions with open source developers during our developer interviews. So let's first start with the characterization of some of those projects that we studied. We were first interested in understanding the cluster sizes within this PR issue graph, as it gives us an idea of how developers commonly work together. So if developers tend to link back to previous work and build on the prior discussion, we might expect to see larger clusters of issues and PRs. On the other hand, if most contributors just make one-off contributions or contribute to basic fixes, we might expect to see smaller clusters. Uh, so here, we collected all of the clusters across all 90,000 nodes, and we found that they follow a power law distribution. So on the x-axis of this graph here is the component size, and on the y-axis is the frequency of clusters of that size. So with this power law distribution, we see that there are very many isolated issues and PRs. So those are issues and PRs that aren't linked to anything else. And on the other hand, we observe very few large clusters of more than 100 nodes. We also observed that there were 10 times as many isolated issues and PRs as there were clusters of size 2. And that's unusual because clusters of size 2 should include those PR issue links that are very frequent on GitHub. On the other hand, what we're observing in practice is that we have a lot of these isolated problems and isolated solutions that don't necessarily apply to another or aren't linked. This power law distribution can help predict growth in certain areas of an open source project, as well as inform prioritization efforts. Because these power law distributions indicate the presence of several highly connected and very impactful nodes, we know that when these clusters of issues and PRs start to expand, it's likely that they'll continue to become larger and more mature initiatives within a project. We also hypothesize that different cluster sizes represent different types of work. So this is gonna be a bunch of graphs, but on the x-axis represents the connected component or cluster size from small to large. So we found that smaller clusters with less than 10 nodes tended to have more issues, which means that there's more concerns being brought up and more discussion. Of those issues, fewer were closed, which means that these uh, problems haven't been addressed yet. 
and there were fewer merge PRs, which means that less work has been done to address those solution, uh, problems. These also have a shorter time span between their first and their last update, which means that the work is currently in progress or is just a smaller, um, less important initiative. Compare this to these larger clusters with more than 100 nodes, which tended to have fewer issues of which more were closed and with more merged PRs and with a longer time span. So we might see these larger clusters as long-term, more mature work in projects, whereas these smaller clusters represent one-off contributions or works in progress. Next, I'll cover the cornerstone of our work, our workflow type definitions. Let's start by taking a look at one of these clusters of connected issues and PRs. So this is an example from the discord.py project, which allows people to make bots and automations with the chat app Discord. So you can see issue eight, uh, 1874 that someone is proposing this feature request. They want an invoked parent feature. And two people have come up with their own distinct implementations for doing so. Pseudosnock on the left has proposed an approach and submitted a PR, but it's been vetoed by the maintainer due to some performance issues, so it's closed. A few days later, Sebilaw comes along to create their own implementation and submit their own PR, which ends up being merged. Note that both of these implementations link back to that initial feature request issue. Pseudosnock uses the fixes link type keyword to connect back to that feature request, and Sebilaw used the resolves keyword. So if we visualize this as a graph, this is what we get. We can see that initial feature request issue, that red square, uh, Pseudosnock's closed PR, that red circle, as well as Sebilaw's accepted and merged PR in that purple circle. So this example is actually one of our competing PR workflow types. So competing PRs abstracts this example a little bit by allowing for arbitrary numbers of competing PRs. You might have any number of closed PRs as long as there's only one PR that fixes that same issue. So each of these workflow type definitions is associated with a work practice, which might be something like breaking your work up into smaller chunks to make review easier. They also have a prototypical graph structure as shown on the slide here. And these graph structures represent a layout of some issues and PRs in a certain configuration. And that configuration might have some constraints. For example, on the type of the nodes it includes, so issue or PR, the status of these nodes, so open, closed, or merged, their authorship or their creation timestamps. We've defined nine of these prototypical workflow type definitions, but I'll just go through a couple today. So sometimes contributors tend to be over eager to contribute their own implementations of a task without otherwise communicating. This is what we've observed in our competing PRs workflow type. Its graph structure, as we've just seen in that discord.py example, is that we have this closed issue that's been fixed by multiple PRs. However, only one of those PRs ends up being accepted or merged into the project. This workflow type has an associated work practice, or in this case, malpractice, of this bit of wasted work due to poor communication. On the other hand, this workflow type also allows projects to be more picky about the implementations that they accept. We remember in that discard.py example that the initial PR was rejected because of some performance implementations. So the maintainers were able to pick the best implementation for their project. Another example of a workflow type that might be quite common in open source is this idea of duplicate issues where people tend to report problems or bring up suggestions that are quite similar to others that have already been proposed. And it now takes away valuable maintainer time to redirect them to other more established discussions. This is what we've captured in our duplicate issue hub workflow type. Its graph structure has these closed issues that are connected to each other by duplicate links. And we can see that this also has a temporal constraint. So the issue on the left, issue number one, has to be created first. It tends to be created before all of these other issues that are marked t greater than zero. Duplicate issue hubs tend to arise when contributors aren't aware of the work being going, uh, going on in a project, or if they just haven't bothered to search through previous issues. And this causes additional maintenance burden. However, I'll note that even though duplicate hu issue hubs tend to be very intuitive, 
they're actually not quite as frequent as you might think. We only observed 15 instances of these duplicate issue hubs over more than 90,000 nodes. What I will note, though, is that when the problems associated with these duplicate issue hubs are very noticeable, as with breaking changes, these duplicate issue hubs tend to grow very large. Here's another example from the discord.py project. This issue 5867 was created due to a breaking change on Discord's implementation end, and it was connected to 11 duplicate issues. So when maintainers notice these duplicate issue hubs becoming large or being high growth, it might be a sign to reevaluate how you're messaging the change that's causing those duplicate issues to better inform end users. So duplicate issue hubs are caused due to a lack of communication. So to combat that, some maintainers tend to try to surface the work being done in a project, so, maintainers, or so contributors will be more aware of what's going on. Here's an example from the Dubo project made by Apache. So it uses a bot to create these weekly update issues that link to all of the PRs that were merged within that week. This is what's encapsulated in our integrating PR issue hub workflow type. It has the structure of this closed PR, uh, merge PR or closed issue that's connected to all of these other merged PRs. And though the Apache Dubo project used an issue to collect all this information about the PRs, some projects also use PRs. So a project might use a release candidate PR to link to all of the other feature PRs that were in that RC before merging that candidate into the mainline branch. You can also notice that there's another temple constraint. So the central hub, that PR or issue, has to be created after these uh, merged PRs, which represents that in practice, this models a documentation or release workflow, where maintainers are surfacing work being done after the fact, so the community is more aware of what's going on. So are any of you familiar with the uh, Stacks PRs development tool called graphite.dev? Okay, so Stacks PR is, is this sort of workflow where instead of making one giant feature PR, you will break your work up into smaller chunks and submit individual PRs with maybe one commit each. For example, I might make a backend PR and then submit another frontend PR that depends on that backend PR and then another localization PR that depends on that frontend. This is what's uh, encapsulated in our dependent PRs workflow type. So this graph structure has these PRs that are created one after another in a chain. And usually these are created by just a single author. These dependent PRs or stacked PRs are regarded as a good practice in the industry because they make code review easier since we only have small and single commits in each PR to review. They're also independent, so making review even easier. And they also don't block development. So developers can continue to work on later PRs, so PR two and three, without waiting for PR1 to be reviewed. Lastly, we also observe that sometimes developers are a little over-eager in their PRs and over-deliver. So here's an example from the gRPC web project. Uh, in this PR, a contributor fixes several issues that are, at first glance, unrelated. So this is usually not a good idea, because when you have unrelated changes in the same PR, that makes it a lot harder to review because now you have to untangle all of the individual changes and it's harder to give feedback on individual implementations. This is what we've captured in our divergent PR workflow type. So it has this graph structure of a merge PR fixing multiple issues at once. This can be both positive and negative. It might be positive if the issues are all related to the same problem and have the same underlying fix. On the other hand, as with that gRPC example, it can be negative when those issues are unrelated because this violates this general principle of small and easy to review independent PRs. Let's now discuss some of these ways that these workflow types uh, compare to each other. So we were interested in understanding how frequently each of these workflow types arose in practice, as this was give us an idea of what the most common ways that people do their work. So we found, uh, we searched through all of the projects to find the number of workflow type matches that they included. And we saw that we had over a thousand instances of workflow types. What's more was that we observed that these workflow types aren't evenly represented across the projects. 
So we had one of our workflow types, the consequent issue PR, which has this graph uh, structure of a problem and issue followed by another solution, this PR, which then was followed by another issue and another PR. So this kind of models a situation where you have an initial fix to a problem, but that fix itself has another issue. So you create another issue and they go on to fix that in a separate PR. So this is very similar to the poll-based development model that GitHub is supposed to support. So it's not surprising that it was one of the most frequent workflow types. On the other hand, the competing PRs, we observe very few of them, which is good. This represents that projects tend to self-regulate and reduce wasted work where possible. So we think that this is because some workflow types tend to be more natural or embedded in software development. And this might be a good benchmark to keep in mind. If your project has a oversized distribution, perhaps a disproportionate amount of competing PRs or duplicate issue hubs, it might be a sign to revisit your code review or bug reporting practices. We also found that workflow types represent our projects fairly well. So about 52% of the nodes that were in a cluster that could have been in these workflow types, so like they were in a cluster, they had some links in it, were indeed in a workflow type match. We were also interested in plotting the frequencies of workflow types across all of our projects. So in the graph here, this x-axis represents the number of nodes within a project, and the y-axis represents the number of workflow types, and each of those dots is a single project. So you can see that most of these projects contained at least one match of a workflow type, though larger projects tended to have more workflow type instances. You can see that the largest projects like uh, Apache Dubo or VNX Poly tended to have uh, about 150 of these workflow type matches. And we think this is because there's a link between the maturity of a project and its need for structured and highly organized collaboration that manifests itself in these workflow types. This is supported by the fact that these small projects that had no workflow type matches were all relatively new or had very few contributions, about a few hundred compared to the thousands for Apache Dubo or Poly. So those were our project's takeaways from these workflow types, but we also wanted to know what other developers thought. So we validated our workflow type definitions in a series of six interviews with open source developers. We had three with closed source and three with open source. And these were centered around introducing developers to this interactive explorer tool that was customized for their project, so it had their project loaded in, and discussing what they thought some of these implementations, implications of these workflow types were. So all of our interviewees noted that workflow types would help make better decisions in certain aspects of the development process. For example, some interviewees brought up that if they saw a lot of duplicate issue hubs, this would remind them to perhaps make a change in the documentation or bug reporting process. Another interviewee had the unique idea that divergent PRs might help prioritize review. So for example, if you saw a uh, competing PRs workflow type, so you had this issue that was trying to be fixed by multiple candidate PRs, but one of those PRs was in a divergent PR hub, so it would also go on to fix many other issues, you might want to go and review that diversion PRs first because it has the uh, possibility to close many other issues. All of our interviewees also noted that this interactive explorer tool was helpful for project management as you could visually understand the interdependencies between features that were currently being developed. And finally, some developers rightfully noted that these workflow types are sort of inherently limited due to not examining the contents of either of these issues or PRs. This is true, but this is also something that we're considering for future work, and we hope that even visualizing and extracting and surfacing some of these initial collaboration patterns is a good first step. So our work has wide-ranging implications. First, we saw that our insights on cluster sizes can help inform prioritization for code review because we know that different cluster size can demonstrate the different types of work involved in those clusters. And from there, we know that these smaller, that work tends to fall into either small or large categories, and those large categories can be very high impact. As well, our interviewees have noted some ways that these workflow types can improve code review or project management practices. 
we saw how the divergent PRs could help signal prioritization for code review and how the Workflow Explorer tool could help visualize interdependencies. As well, that Workflow Explorer tool can also identify visually these areas with wasted work in a project where there are outsized numbers of competing PRs or duplicate issue hubs or any of the other workflow type definitions that represent wasted work. Other researchers like Hirao et al. have also noted that current code review tools or duplicate issue hub identification tools might be improved by further examining the contents of links between issues and PRs. So we've already expanded this perspective to consider multiple issues and links at a time. We've also seen how our insights on cluster sizes, so smaller clusters being generally a good first issue because they're not linked to much of this other context, can help improve these other duplicate issue detection tools. But the biggest next step for our project is talking more with developers like you to understand the implications of our workflow type definitions. So if you'd like to work with us on understanding workflow types in context in your project, please feel free to reach out to us or find me after this talk. Today, I've covered our novel graph-based perspective, as well as our ideas for workflow type definitions and their attributes and implications for open source development. One of the core pluses of our approach is that it's automatable, making it easier for maintainers to identify and curb unwanted patterns of development. Uh, think of this PR issue graph as a sort of Grafana to monitor your project's collaboration health. It can help identify uh, problem areas as early alerting when things start going south, and also serve as a global reference point to understand your project as a whole. Again, if you'd like to work with us, you can reach our collaborating corresponding author um, on the emails here. And one last uh, bump that I am looking for fall 2024 and winter 2025 internships. So if your team is hiring, please do let me know. Uh, thank you so much for coming to our talk and hope you have a great rest of your conference. Uh, if you'd like to stick around, we can go for questions next. Yeah. Yeah, so we kind of observed that they were indeed like more emergent patterns that were sort of arising out of context, but we needed a sort of term to sort of categorize each of these uh, workflow types or patterns because we were observing them so many times across different projects. And so we wanted to sort of give it an implication that this is something that happens repeatedly. So workflow types and workflow patterns are sort of synonyms that we were interchanging actually in the paper. But for this talk, just to keep it consistent, I just use the term workflow type. Yeah. Yeah. Some of our workflow type definitions, we call them definitions, but we've built in some of flexibility around them. So for example, some can support like arbitrary numbers of competing PRs or arbitrary number of duplicate issue hubs. And you'll see, for example, in that like integrating PR issue hub, we had alternatives for like if you use a PR or an issue to collect all the work. So we've tried to build in some flexibility. But thanks for that feedback. Yeah. That's a, that's a good call out. We haven't thought about that, but we've thought about sort of understanding these workflow types in sequences too. So I think that might be a good uh, research direction. I will forward that to my supervisors. <laughs> yeah. Is there going to be a paper at some point? There is actually a paper on this. It just got accepted to FSC 2024 yesterday, so let's go. <laughs> uh, if you want to find the paper, I believe uh, it's, I can link it to the slides that I showed there. Uh, yeah, in the back. Uh, one thing that I saw that seemed a little odd to me in the workflow definitions was that you had the temporal constraint on the duplicate issue uh, pattern. Because in my experience, the temporality of which one's open first seems to be less important than which one was open best in a distributed issue hub. That uh, the winner is usually the one where somebody provided the code details, uh, especially in that situation where the hub is large. 
Yeah. We also, we also observe this where it's like, in general, it's like the most expanded upon issue. But I think like just because we needed a way to make these queries like most, we tried to like remove as many like factors as possible from our queries so we could find all of these occurrences. So we kind of just arbitrarily applied a heuristic that usually the first created one was the one with these uh, most thorough details. It's usually the one that's um, connected to. So in our queries, it's uh, the details is like we're searching for that hub and that hub is usually either created first or tends to have like the best um, reproduced details, as you've mentioned. But would the pattern find a hub that had not been created first but still had a bunch of independent objects? So that's another thing I'm wondering about is like, if the, if the dependency root for a bunch of other things both of dependency is not the first one, does it get invalidated in the pattern? I have to double check with the query on that one, but I think it would still find it because it's looking for that, it's looking for the hub basically that's connecting to multiple things. I saw another question, so, yeah? Um, so I had an open source project I wanted to make it in. Uh, is it just for the open source for running? Like, how do I know the UBC library? Oh, yeah. Uh, you can find it github.com slash ubcdlab slash PR issue topology project, something like that. OK, sure. Uh, I'll make a note. Yeah? Yeah, so I think what you're describing is sort of more like this continuously updated um, like PR list. But what we were observing was more like finite, um, finite start to end date updates. So like with that Dubo project, we have like weekly updates. And some projects have like every release, like before they merge the like release candidate into the mainline branch, they make like a big PR. So we observe uh, very few of those. I don't think we observed any of those like updating uh, like tracker lists, but it just might depend on like the projects that we were studied. Yeah, so uh, what you're talking about is sort of like work that's currently going on and like it's in progress. But I think one of the design decisions we made for this study was to focus on merged PRs and closed uh, issues because that would represent work that was sort of like done at the point of scraping them. So churn isn't something that we've looked at, but I will also forward that to my supervisors. Yeah. Uh, we can't. Det we don't detect that right now because what we're looking for is the links at sort of the issue or PR level, whereas what you're talking about is the linking at like a commit level. But it, we can apply like a similar approach in relating these issues and PRs. Yeah. Future work. Yeah.
is a movement that goes without ceasing any Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's also a very valuable perspective that I also add in my notes. I think what we were focusing on were more like the heuristics that we could immediately apply to like figure out certain aspects of development. But from talking to y'all, there seems to be like extra aspects that might also need to be considered. Yeah. No, that's not something we've um, considered. But actually, now that I think about it, that's actually, I think that's especially frequent in like projects that have some sort of company or like organization behind it. Because internally, you know like what you need to do, but you just want to like keep track of it in in public for GitHub. So that's also another idea for a workflow type that I'll add. Okay, cool. If there's no more questions, thank you so much for coming. Have a great rest of your conference.